this, this morning's event is uh, being recorded for posterity uh, on the theory, it seems to me a very unlikely theory, that it will be helpful to uh, future puzzled people uh, <laughs> hoping to write a curriculum unit. Uh, my part of it involves a PowerPoint, which I hope not too many of you have seen before because not a single word of it has changed. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we'll, we'll soldier on anyway. Uh, and I think we have a, a, a fabulous panel this morning and a, and, and, and a kind of a spontaneous way of, of sorting out the material that we're going to be uh, uh, presenting to you. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we want to begin uh, with uh, Eric Lawrenson, who will talk about getting started. Uh, there are various permutations of, of, of getting started, as I'm sure you all know at the moment. Uh, and then uh, Laura Carroll Koch will talk about revision uh, and the permutations of revision. Uh, and then I'll uh, power up with my PowerPoint. Uh, and, and that, forgive me, will go on a little longer uh, than let's say the average speaking time you'll be hearing this morning because, well, you know, it's PowerPoint and it just takes a while to get through. Uh, but I'm going to try to streamline it as much as I can. Uh, and then Janice Carlisle uh, will conclude uh, by talking about the organization of the unit uh, and I trust that she will also succeed in organizing everything we've said <laughs> hitherto. Uh, and that will be a fortunate thing as well. So in any case, let's begin with uh, Eric Lawrenson on getting started. Good morning, everybody. The idea of getting started already in the last less than 24 hours, 18 hours, I've had two conversations with fellows that have tremendously clarified my idea about my unit. And this is my whatever many units <laughs> um, that I've done. And um, the idea is that we are here for each other and that you, it, you, the voice that you're using for your unit to write is to write as though you're writing to another teacher, to yourself, uh, to explain what it is that you want to do and how you're going to do it in your classroom for your students. Um, the other thing is get started. <laughs> Don't, hopefully you've done research over the last couple months and stuff like that ever since we were here in May and even before that um, and now you're able to begin to articulate those ideas. Um, you've done a prospectus, hopefully they were um, you know, successful. Um, some of them need to be tweaked and stuff like that, but you're well along your way. Some of that prospectus can be used as directly in your unit. It could be part of your overview. It, it could be part of different aspects of it. So the idea is that you're going to take what you've done and keep compiling. Then the last thing I'll say is just um, articulate your ideas so that, um, that you are as clear to yourself as you would be to somebody else and practice with each other taking the time to sit down in five minutes or ten minutes and say what you're going to do. If you are afraid to do that, you are probably not going to be successful in your writing. So sit down, grab people at lunch or breakfast or dinner or whatever or just sitting in the lounges and stuff like that. Be out in the common areas. Don't hold yourself up in your room for eight days and then come out and be like, oh, here, you know, this is all about us doing this together. And it's a collaboration. So with that, I will pass it on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Um, when I was asked to speak um, on revision, it immediately made me think of painting and layering painting on a canvas because um, this forum is such a collaboration of learning and knowledge from our seminar leaders, from our seminar fellows, and from conversations over dinner, coffee, breakfast. And revision um, is a tool in um, which we can infuse that knowledge into our units and elaborate certain points of view, um, maybe highlight a particular subject that we have a conversation with over dinner. Um, when we, when, we, when we integrate all that we're learning to the structure we've brought with us, it just um, creates this unique 
piece of work that is unlike anything I've ever experienced or unlike anything that you can get in any other um, arena. So um, as a result, your unit will have both your ideas but this collaborative thinking, the synergy of this whole group, which will be you know, quite a unique piece of work. So that's one um, unique experience that I know that we'll all probably have here. Thank you very much, Eric and, and Laura. Uh, now, um, now the ordeal begins. Uh, I, I'm going to comment only briefly on these passages uh, as, as they uh, flash before you. Um, uh, that, I didn't write that. Um, but I, I, b by the way, I agree with it. And I think you'll see that it confirms much that Eric was saying. Uh, and, and so it is, it is well to take it to heart. But let me, let me go back a, a, a stage or two. Um, on page two of the document that you find in your brochure, uh, you find outlined the parts or sections of the uh, curriculum unit. Uh, and they're called their content objectives, teaching strategies, classroom activities, and an appendix that I'll touch on briefly, and I think I've reversed these last two, uh, and lists of resources. Lists of resources being for teachers, books for teachers, reading materials for teachers, for students, uh, and in some cases, but I think this is definitely local option, uh, lists of materials appropriate for use uh, in the classroom. I would think that would apply primarily to uh, seminars in science, to, to, to teaching in science. Uh, so in any case, that's the way it's broken down in the guidelines. And that's basically it. That's basically the idea. Let me say very quickly about that. You don't need to give these parts of the curriculum unit as headings if you don't wish to. That is to say, you can let them flow into each other. It's simply advised as what nowadays one calls best practice, I guess, to, uh, to uh, compose your thoughts roughly in that order as you go along and put them in that order. Now, uh, I'm about to uh, confront you with a bit of confusion here because the first nine slides that you're going to see here, and again, you know, I assure you, you're going to see them very quickly. The first nine slides uh, are all under the heading of what in the guidelines we call content objectives. But I actually give them various titles because I think of them as, as, as parts of the development of your thinking within what's called content objectives. Uh, and unfortunately, in some of the latter slides, I do use the word objectives. Uh, please don't be confused by that. I just, uh, I, I, I just mean that these are various aspects of what you're probably going to want to say under the broad umbrella, content objectives. So this first one, uh, I think is interesting because, uh, you know, it, it gives the reason why you think the unit is important. The teacher is, is, is upset that uh, the student's writing, even when it's competent to, in some measure, is wooden. And so they want somehow to liven it up. Uh, and they say, well, write more the way you speak. Um, I say I agree largely with that. Obviously, one can overdo it. <laughs> Uh, I, but uh, in, in effect, um, I think in, maybe this will allay an anxiety, I don't know. We have no particular objection to the first person singular. No reason, no reason not to use it. Um, if that's what you feel comfortable with and if it streamlines your sentences, which is an important thing. In other words, if, 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 if it leaves, if, if, if it allows you to be a little less uh, stilted than you might be if you kept trying to avoid the first person singular. Uh, in any case, thanks, Jing. Next. Now, what's, this is, this is uh, I think, a, a very interesting description of what, the, of, of what the teacher wants the students to start thinking about as a literature teacher. In other words, yes, we can all immediately begin to talk about power and powerlessness. But after all, uh, what we want to do is mediate it through a text. And what's, and what's good, I think, uh, about this passage is that it shows us simultaneously what the teacher wants to get across, what, what the teacher wants the students to be thinking about and to come away with. But at the same time, it insists that it's a literary process arriving at these conclusions. 
it, 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 it involves teaching to the standards. You know, in high school, uh, if you're teaching to the test in, in the language arts, you got to talk about rhetorical devices and things like that. Uh, and all of this is brought in for the purpose of uh, arriving at a theme through uh, uh, the text of Macbeth. Uh, next, Jing, thanks. Um, now, another thing that you're probably going to want to be talking about at some, some point, some people begin with this, uh, is the demographics of your classroom situation. Now, I sometimes feel uh, that we linger too long over that. We are writing for teachers, as everybody has been insisting, and they, and, and they know uh, pretty quickly, without too much um, uh, detail needing to be thrown at them, uh, what the variety of classroom demo demographics might be like. But still, it's very important, it's an important thing to establish it, because that way your teacher-reader understands uh, the situation you face in your classroom and why you're tailoring your unit in a certain way to meet the needs of those students at whatever level, whatever degree of ability, uh, anywhere between K through K and 12. Uh, and so it's important to establish, but perhaps also important uh, not to linger over too long. I think this is a good example because it's succinct. It says what needs to be said, uh, but it doesn't, as I say, dwell on it. Um, next one, thanks. Now, now, really, this is also about um, uh, demographics, I think. Um, but the most, but what really interests me about it is that in addressing other teachers, that is to say, the audience for which it's written, it says, well, I have a certain situation. This is the way chemistry is taught in my school. It may be different in your school. And you may be teaching at a slightly different level, but a level that might still be appropriate for working with these materials. OK. In that case, I recommend that if you're teaching at a certain level, you do such and such. So keep in mind, when you write your units, that, you're, that the teachers who may very well be interested in your, in your unit, in your topic, aren't necessarily teaching to the same audience or under the same circumstances. And in that case, uh, naturally, they're going to need to worry about tailoring your unit for their own ends. Uh, and the kind of advice you can give them uh, about how to do that or what you would recommend if you yourself were teaching a slightly different constituency uh, is, I think, very well uh, embodied in that last sentence. It's a good example of, of, uh, of doing that kind of thing. Next. So I'm still calling this overview or introduction and rationale. Uh, this, is a, this, this is a unit uh, in which the theme is the relationship between gender and genre. In other words, is there any sense in which the performance of a gender role is influenced by the kind of genre within which uh, the performance appears? Uh, and I think, I, I think it's an extremely good uh, description of the way in which we arrive at a rather advanced theoretical conclusion. This teacher really does demand a lot uh, from her students, uh, and gets it too, I think, uh, uh, by way of moving through the sorts of classroom experience that we all share uh, and know because all of us teach at least Macbeth, uh, if not the Taming of the Shrew. Uh, and so we can, uh, there are various ways in which a pas passage like this allows us to relate to it. Uh, next, please. Now, what I like about this passage is that the teacher says, I have always taught Douglas's autobiography in a certain way, right? And that was fine. I liked doing that. But under the influence of the kinds of emphases featured in the seminar that I'm now taking, I have decided to teach Douglas's narrative in a different way. And, uh, but nevertheless, and this is what I think underlies this passage and reassures the teacher-reader, the old way I taught it met all kinds of standards, well and good, but also the new way I'm going to teach it also meets standards. I'm doing something innovative in my own practice and maybe even in my school district, and yet it still does uh, meet uh, standards in a way that, that can easily be approved of. So thank you. Next. See, we're still, we're, we're still in the, uh, oh, good, somebody, let's see, in order to, yeah, 
Oh, good. These are new titles. Thank you, whoever whoever did it. I'm sure they've cl they've cleared up all the confusion. But we're still we're still working with different aspects of uh, what I call of of what the the guidelines call content objectives. In other words, we're still in the first part, which I believe it, which is the most substantive part for most of you. Some of you will perforce for whatever reasons throw more emphasis maybe on strategies, but for the most part, most of us will be working uh, most continuously and most substantively on this initial content objectives. Uh, because that's what shows, uh, for one, that, that, that's what reflects, for one thing, the influ influence of the content-based seminar you're participating in, and also shows the teacher-reader that you have a certain command of the subject matter, uh, and, that it's, and that it is out of this command uh, that you uh, can apply the strategies uh, to which you turn uh, in the next section. So we're still in content objectives, um, and what I like about this is that it is, th th this is a, a, a student who, uh, a student, a teacher who knows a great deal about Renaissance literature, uh, had, has extraordinary infectious enthusiasm for the teaching of it, uh, obviously succeeds in doing so, and, and, and the strength of this passage is that it shows how what we call assessment can enter in uh, to, the, to the classroom experience while uh, all of this rather complex and interesting information is being taught. We're already pointing in the direction of strategies, in other words. We're, we're, we're edging uh, out the door of content objectives and into strategies. And what, and, and, and what this passage emphasizes uh, is, as I say, assessment, a way, in which, a, a way in which the evaluation of the progress being made by the student uh, can uh, take hold. Uh, next. This is, this is another uh, a, a passage that relies on the, uh, uh, the book about expository writing by Peter Elbow, uh, recommending uh, the importance of, of voice and its authority and how it's, tra and how it's transmitted to a reader. Uh, but this passage is different, obviously. It would be farther along in the argument uh, that, uh, of the first uh, slide that we looked at. Uh, and now uh, it's talking about the author's understanding of the subject matter. In other words, it's all very well to say uh, you should write more as though you had a voice. But then, of course, the question is, well, what is voice? What do we mean by voice? And it's in a passage like this that uh, the author uh, is beginning to take that up. Uh, and relying on an authority, Peter Elbow, uh, with whom one may or may not disagree, uh, uh, he, he, he develops uh, a concept of what voice is uh, and presents it and presents it to the reader. So I think that's uh, a good passage as well. Uh, and then the next one, of course, I understand that formula. You know, I, I, was, I, was, I was born understanding it. I always, I, 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 I always ask, uh, sheepishly ask one of my science colleagues whether it's true. I, I, well, what do I know? Uh, but there it is. Uh, and I take it uh, that this is a nice example of laying out information, again, content, um, that the teacher may be interested in acquiring. And I think the important thing in doing that, which, which this passage reflects, is that you're not just showing off. In other words, you're, 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 not just, you're, you're not just displaying your knowledge about something for its own sake. There is always in the back of your mind that this knowledge is what feeds itself into the teaching process. And so the way in which this information is organized is all with a view to the idea that it's going to be taught down the road, that soon you're going to turn to strategies. And you say, oh boy, I can't wait because I've been in content objectives for quite a while now. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and we are getting there. In fact, the next slide, uh, we arrive at it. I think this is a good example of the way in which, I mean, I think it, it, it's obviously difficult uh, sometimes for some of us, if not all of us, to say, well, first I talk about strategies and then I talk about teaching activities. What's the difference, really? I mean, why can't I just go ahead and talk about teaching activities? Because they entail my strategies. My strategies will be made clear if I do that. Well, obviously the notion that first you should talk about strategies is that it's an overview within which 
your teaching activities uh, from which your teaching activities emerge. Uh, this has a this has I think a useful abstraction. This is the way I do things generally uh, when I want uh, when I want students uh, to perform scenes, which is which is the heart of the activities that the uh, author will then go on to describe. But generally speaking, this is how we handle it. Uh, this is how we approach it. This is how we make people comfortable, uh, and and so on. So that I think uh, is a very good example of a teaching strategy. Next. Now the other two are already teetering on the brink of classroom activities, and I, I don't say they aren't because you can see uh, that in this case uh, questions are starting to be asked concerning concerning a particular text. Uh, that sounds an awful lot like a classroom activity, but at the same time, I think the virtue of it is, and the reason why it belongs appropriately under strategies, is that it is uh, obviously something from which you can generalize. This is what I do when I give them a poem. I ask them questions, these questions, but I also ask them questions of this kind. So I think it has the degree of abstraction that's appropriate for the teaching uh, strategies section. Next. And this is the last strategy slide. Uh, and once again, you could say, well, it's an activity, but it's a sustained activity. It's this is what we're going to be doing accompanied by the reading of Levy's uh, periodic table. Uh, and, and this is going to be the atmosphere and the methodology in general that's used in the classroom during this period. So again, I think it's a good uh, passage uh, il illustrating uh, strategy. Now, teaching activities, next. I really, I really uh, uh, classroom activities, I, I really want to say only one thing about it. I've got a couple of examples. Uh, classroom activities, you say, well, that's what I do every morning. I call them lesson plans, right? Well, yeah, they are, they are like lesson plans, but we want to make the distinction between uh, our tendency, just as a kind of shorthand in preparing lesson plans, to do everything with bullet points, you know? This, 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 boom, boom, these questions, these materials, uh, and so on, without much reflection in writing on the purpose of the exercise. So we want classroom activities, like everything else in the curriculum unit, to be in prose. Uh, by and large, if possible, to avoid bullet pointing, although you will see in these examples, uh, did I, oh, I, I guess I skipped over one. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I thought we were already in activities, uh, and I'm not going to repeat what I just said. Um, but uh, I, uh, yeah, this, I, I think this is a good passage because it allows students to demonstrate multicultural awareness. In other words, it shows how students can, that can, can, can become empowered in the process of thinking about something. Yes, they're told uh, about uh, private uh, speech habits, about, uh, 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 about, about infracultural ways of, of speaking that aren't quite the same thing as public speech. And then they're asked, well, are there occasions like that in your own life in which maybe you speak in a different way from the way you speak in public? And the next thing you know, they're, they're thinking about sort of uh, what it's like to be multi multicultural. They're thinking about multicultural awareness, their own practice in relation to a broadly accepted social practice in which they also participate. Uh, and so I think this is a very good example of, a po of, of, of uh, um, uh, empowerment of students. Next. All right, now here, what I was going to say about bullet pointing is sure, this has numbers, right? Fine, it has numbers. But in general, I just want to make the point that uh, we want the description of classroom activities, we hope that they will be uh, in prose, uh, as, which is as, as, as fully prose um, as what you write uh, in the rest of the unit. In other words, uh, perhaps not dissimilar to a lesson plan, but more thought through, perhaps. Than, I mean, you know what you're doing when you write a lesson plan. But you're not writing for a reader. You're writing for yourself. Oh, maybe you're writing for your principal, but principal sort of knows the drill as well. Uh, you're not writing for a strange reader uh, whose understanding of what you're doing you can't take for granted. And that's what you want to remember in talking about a classroom activity in the uh, curriculum units. Next. All right, I have two examples of appendices. 
Uh, and the point about the appendix concerning standards, which, by the way, you may have anticipated in a variety of ways during the course of writing the unit. The point about the appendices, though, is we don't w just want lists of standards, which in themselves wouldn't be intelligible to a reader. I think probably you should address the standards you have in mind selectively so that you can actually say something about them. You can say, this, 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 this is what this standard means and this is how my unit applies to it. So that we're hoping for a paragraph or so uh, in which standards uh, uh, can be uh, explained and rationalized. Uh, uh, your, the relation of your unit to the standards can be explained and rationalized to a reader. Next. Uh, and this is another example. This one uh, does uh, lay out a list of standards in bulleted fashion, but then after that, uh, you get that you get the paragraph of explanation, and that's why we think it valuable. I'll say only one thing about the list of resources, uh, and then I'll stop. Uh, the the it, it's a question whether or not the list of resources should be annotated. In other words, whether there should be a brief a uh, phrase or a sentence explaining why you think the title you've put down is important. I think that, again, should be local option. I think that you should pr talk about that with your seminar leaders, ask your seminar leader whether that, whether that person thinks uh, that it's worthwhile to do. Uh, I don't think the list of resources should take up all that much space. I think there are more important things to do, although they certainly are useful to your readers. Uh, and so I worry that they will balloon out uh, if they are too fully commented on. Uh, so I have myself a certain nervousness about that, uh, but it's certainly something that we actually encourage in many cases. And as I say, I think you should talk to your semin leader, seminar leaders about how best, uh, how best uh, to uh, work up your lists of resources. Thank you very much. I am sorry I took so long, uh, and I apologize in particular to Janice. <laughs> <laughs> I am at somewhat of a disadvantage here. I am following Eric and Laura, my colleagues. Um, I'm also following Paul's celebrated PowerPoint. But beyond that, I am talking about organization. It has to be, or it could be. Um, I'm trying to say it doesn't have to be this. Um, it could be a subject that is as dull as ditch water. And I think what you need to do as you're working on your units is put yourself into a frame of mind in which you are trying to apply as much imagination and creativity to how you present your unit as you have done in thinking about what your students need and thinking about your subject uh, in thinking about um, the reader to whom you will be addressing your information. So what I've done in this handout is to give you at the top the parts of the unit as presented in the guidelines. And Paul told you um, about these. Thank you. Is that better? Um, Paul told you about these um, in his PowerPoint. But I also wanted to give you two examples of actual structures that two fellows developed uh, in the local seminar that I had the pleasure of leading a couple of years ago. Um, the first is Laura's, and the other is um, by Carol Boynton. And I think you can see immediately the differences between the two of them. Carol um, takes five different sections to reach strategies. Um, because she wants her readers to be able to locate her description of the writer's workshop model and why it is pertinent to what she is doing. Um, she also wants to have her readers think about visual literacy as a separate subject, and she wants her readers to think about drawing as thinking. Um, in the same way that I'm trying to urge you to think about organization as a matter of um, creativity and imagination because it is primarily a matter of thought. How do these ideas work in relation to a particular audience? 
And then you will see other examples um, in these two different um, schemes of the way in which um, subsections and then subsections of those subsections um, are used to keep the organization clear for the reader. And um, one point I think to be made about an organization is that you don't want it to be mysterious. Um, one of the things that you're trying to do is establish your authority as a writer of this unit. And you do that in a number of different ways. Um, one of them is by creating a persona that your reader can believe in. Um, you have to present yourself um, in your writing as someone who's well informed and is committed to trying to understand and solve the problem that you're presenting. Um, and you also, um, I think, establish your authority through your organization. If at any point your reader is thinking, I don't know where this has come from and I don't know where it is going, then your reader is going to say, wait a minute, does this person really know what he or she is doing? So make the organization clear, make it creative, and always think about your reader. Um, I could give you the kind of um, standard advice about organization, but I think you've probably all heard it. You have to put your paragraphs in a logical order. Paragraph C has to follow necessarily from paragraph A. Every paragraph needs a topic sentence, and every section of your um, unit needs to put the main point that it is making up front. Again, no mystery, no secret, no, I'm going to reveal this to you eventually. <laughs> that, that doesn't work. Um, in, it doesn't? <laughs> no. <laughs> It doesn't, it doesn't work in actually most writing that I know of that is not, say, a novel or a poem or a play. Um, and we're not doing that. Um, so um, do try to make it clear. Try to follow the standard rules. Um, think about your transitions. If you are putting at the beginnings of paragraphs first, second, third, fourth, you're cheating because you're using a really simple way of saying, okay, these paragraphs really do fit together, and I'm not gonna to explain to you why they do. Mm -hmm. So you have to make sure that one paragraph follows on another with a topic sentence that actually speaks to what you've been doing in the previous paragraph and prepares for the next one. Um, the final thing I want to say, and this um, actually uh, follows from one of the things that Laura um, has been talking about is the whole process of revision. Don't think if you've got a structure down that it is carved in stone. It is something that you can change as you go along. If you discover you need subsections, put them in, um, but try to look at what you are doing in terms of what your reader needs. Um, I think we all know that there is a psychology of writing and a psychology of writing a long piece like a curriculum unit. Um, I think we all know that it's extremely hard work. Um, there are times when you're sitting there in front of your computer, at least I sit in front of my computer going, I can't do this, it can't be done. Um, and you have to get yourself through those moments. And I think as you're starting, as you're getting started, one of the ways of doing that is to be very excited about the ideas. And if you don't feel excited about the ideas, sit there and say, I'm very excited about these <laughs> ideas. Um, it will actually work. You can talk yourself into the state of mind that you need. Um, and I think by the time you are looking at the um, draft that you are doing of the first two thirds of the unit, you should be getting very excited about your reader, what your reader is, who your reader might be. Um, I know it's hard in the abstract, um, particularly for those of you who haven't um, done this uh, a number of times, it's hard in the abstract to think that someone is actually going to read your work. 
Well, they do. Um, in the um, local seminar that I led a couple of years ago, one of the women came in and she said, guess what, I just heard from a teacher in Chicago who had read my last unit. And it happens. Um, this is a very, very popular site. I think Jim can probably give you the number of hits um, that it receives. And so try to be excited about what your reader might do with what you've been thinking about. Thank you. More than a million hits, I believe, world, worldwide. Is that right, Jim? Two million, two million hits million. worldwide. Every one of those two million people is reading your unit, word <laughs> by word. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're going to throw the floor. We're going to throw the floor open to questions. Uh, I, and and but we can't observe our usual practice of going into the audience with microphones. So we're going to ask you to pose your question, and then, uh, for the sake of the film, I'm going to repeat the question uh, and direct it to the appropriate respondent. Please. How can we distinguish, because there's talk of, of the element of research that goes into a curriculum unit, how can we distinguish between a uh, research paper and a curriculum unit? Well, I think um, that the question allows me to talk for just a second about claims. Um, and I talked in May about thinking of your prospectus in terms of setting out your problem. And setting out your problem and making your claim at the beginning of your unit. And realizing that it's wonderful, your reader will find it um, wonderful and helpful if you have done research on a particular subject, um, visual literacy for instance. But in every single paragraph, that has to be connected back to what you're trying to accomplish in your unit. So it's not as if there's a section of research that stands out. It's, it has to be integrated into the writing of the entire unit. I, then, when I say it has to be, I feel a little nervous. <laughs> so take that with a grain of salt. Uh, it, it might be usefully <laughs> integrated. In and, every and, and, let me, and let me just add, I, I mentioned uh, in the course of what I was saying that um, uh, that, in effect, um, what one was talking about under the heading uh, content or content objectives um, is toward an end, and the end is teaching. And so uh, the research, and I, the word research makes me a little nervous because, I, you know, a senior essay at Yale really isn't expected to do research in the sense of original research. You know, I mean, no, no, nobody expects from any of us, uh, ex unless by serendipity, whether in the lab or the library, uh, that we will stumble across something new, that's some, some, something that's never been seen before. Uh, the point is to master materials that are known uh, for the purpose uh, of teaching them. And that has to be, in the brief time we have for it, also a selective process. Nobody expects completely Catholic or omniscient knowledge of a subject, but just well-informed background. And I am more comfortable with the word background, to tell you the truth, in, 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 in work done in the humanities at least, uh, than I am with research. Uh, yeah, you're going to want to read. You're going to want to read around in your area. But I don't think you have to think of it necessarily as research. Should the appendix be all entirely devoted to a rationalization of the standards to which it applies, when indeed there may be objectives of the curriculum unit that aren't directly related to such standards as may be local or in application uh, for a given teacher? The way I would want to think of that is that we perhaps do think of the appendix as a place specifically where we talk about standards and rationalization but that the unit as a whole, especially under content objectives, and especially uh, in, through the momentum of its enthusiasm, uh, should get across 
uh, I would think without question that, for example, critical thinking is involved, uh, higher order thinking, if you will, uh, and that uh, some, which is sometimes incorporated in certain standards, uh, but that, uh, but that the, um, what can I say, pedagogical and intellectual enthusiasm of the unit uh, is something that should uh, communicate itself uh, pervasively through the document. And that the appendix, uh, I think, should be, again, just perhaps to prevent it from ballooning, uh, uh, should be devoted to this question of explaining what the connection of your unit uh, is uh, to the standards that apply in your district or in your state or, or core, or, core or, or, or whatever the case may be. Well, I've read the new standards, <laughs> if that helps. Um, but I think you have to, you could do that better. Um, you could try to think about how your subject is related to the Common Core and its um, requirements as you are writing it. And so then when you get to the appendix, it won't be so difficult to actually articulate how it is that what you're doing responds to the Common Core. Does that make sense? So it, it's, it's not as if I, th I think the entire unit becomes subject to the standards, but it's how the subject of the unit and the approaches that you want to take in the classroom can be coordinated with the standards. And I, I think it also helps uh, in that appendix not to try to list, say, 20 standards, but find the two or three that are most relevant to what you are doing and really explain why you are fulfilling the, that requirement or that expectation, perhaps. And I was just going to add to that, I think it's really important to keep track of your sources and to do it in a logical way um, so that you know when you are <coughs> quoting an author, when you're paraphrasing, when you're summarizing, and you know when you're adding your own ideas in your notes. Um, whatever way you do it, just try to keep it as, you won't be surprised by this word, as organized as possible. <laughs> Uh, there, there is an interest uh, among many authors of curriculum units and including uh, graphics and images. Uh, then the question arises uh, whether copyright issues also uh, uh, might uh, be involved. Uh, and so then the question concludes, uh, is it therefore advisable uh, simply to point to the sources of graphics and images rather than actually including them? Uh, Janice, what about works of art? Well, luckily, um, <laughs> at Yale, if you find anything that you want to use in the Yale Art Gallery, or anything that you want to use in the Yale Center for British Art, you can use it. Um, you don't have to ask for permission. You can put it in your curriculum unit. You can have it published in your curriculum unit. It's yours and everyone's. Um, so that's really a great advantage because a couple of years ago, the process of getting permission was very, very complicated. Um, but I'd like to pass this on to Laura, who had another solution to this problem. Did I? I did. <laughs> I did. <laughs> oh, I drew them myself. <laughs> um, my unit that um, Janice is referring to was a um, was an, a visual image that I created, which didn't need copywriting. Thank you, Janice. She's so nice. But uh, something else I wanted to say, actually. I was surprised at how quickly I was able to get a copyright, copyright permission in a unit I had done last year on the brain from a website. I, I, noted the, I emailed the author of the website and he responded to me in almost 30 minutes. So that is, that's an option as well. And I would encourage visual images, um, especially if they are um, supporting your, the language and the concepts that you're trying to get across. I think they really add a lot. 